the show that reveals how extraordinary items in our world are designed, constructed and produced. See the engineering, the technology and big ideas that make the world go round. Find out how it works. Coming up, you're off on holiday and you want your suitcases to survive the baggage area. We look at some rough and ready aluminium luggage that's up for the job. The grass may be greener on the other side, but everyone has to mow their lawn. We'll find out how the design of the blade makes your life so much easier. And the UK just can't get enough of those tortilla chips. We'll visit a factory that produces them by the ton. But first, the cowboy is a hard-working man. Roping cattle and branding them can be really tough work, not least for the cow. But one of the hardest parts of the job is the scorching desert sun, and this is where the cowboy's hat comes in. So how do you make a hat that John Wayne would be proud to wear? Well, the secret is in the fur. Much of a good quality hat is rabbit, but the rest is finest quality beaver. Yes, those toothy little tree-loving rodents provide the important ingredient for making cowboy hats the way they should be. The two furs need to be combined. That happens here. And once it's all mixed up, it's fed into this ancient machine. You may think it looks like something out of the 30s, and you'd be right. This factory in Texas was built in 1938, and the process of making cowboy hats is the same now as it was then. The fur falls into these enormous trays underneath. Now, you'd think we'd be ready to go, but not just yet. There's one more detail to sort out first. If you want to get a tough hat that will survive some cattle rustling, you need the short hairs. Shorter fibers bond better and make a stronger hat. So this machine is used to get rid of the longer fur. They're ejected out of the bottom while the shorter hairs are kept in the mix. Each hat needs exactly seven ounces of the rabbit and beaver mix. It's piled onto this conveyor and then a vacuum sucks it off into a centrifugal vortex. As it spins round, it sticks to the large pillar in the middle and bonds together. Once all the fur has stuck, the workers cover the pillar in a damp jute cloth and send the hat for a bath at 90 degrees Celsius. Without this treatment, the fur wouldn't stick together. The water and the heat help the fibers to bond. Now at this point, you've got an enormous cone, more Harry Potter than John Wayne, but it's still early in the process, so hold your horses. A cowboy hat has to be tough, so the fibers need to be well bonded. The cones are twisted into a cigar shape and placed on these rollers. The kneading, rolling motion will knit the fibers together. Each one is rolled and then bathed several times. By the end of the process, the material will have shrunk by almost 60%, but it still doesn't look very Wild West just yet. At this stage, the hat looks more like something a farmer might wear, but this will be a cowboy hat soon, it just needs a bit more work. But before they start being properly shaped, they need to be dyed. Two and a half hours in here at 80 degrees Celsius will give these hats a rich dark brown color. Now anyone who's seen a cowboy film will know that there are plenty of colors and styles available. It's time to give them their proper shape. No cowboy hat would be complete without a brim. So these machines will help to stretch and shape each one. Combinations of hot and cold water, stretching the material and quick drying mean the hat finally starts to take on a familiar form. As well as its shape, the hats also need to be made in different sizes. There are very few cowboys today who'd be able to fill John Wayne's boots, let alone his hat.
Each one goes into one of these machines, which will use a combination of the grips and hot steam to pull it out wide. Once stretched, he will insert the sizing block and the machine will press it into place. Although they work in a tough environment, the traditional cowboy hat has a soft velvety texture to it. Here, freshly made hats are being sanded down. The production processes have roughened the material, so the sanders are used to produce a soft and delicate texture. The only downside is that the sanders leave small felt balls on the hat surface, but these can be removed easily with fire. Now there are two stages to giving a cowboy hat its particular style. The first is the shape of the crown. A series of hydraulic presses means several hats can be produced at a time. The worker selects the mold for a particular style, he then places the hat and mold into the press and then switches it on. The hat finally emerges with the familiar three dents of the cattleman style. The other important bit is the brim. They can be quite flat or extremely curved, depending on the cowboy's personal tastes. Some brims can be as wide as 10 centimeters. Every year, this company produces over half a million genuine cowboy hats. Prices range from hundreds of dollars to thousands, but it's a small price to pay for protection when your office is the wild, wild west. Ever since the low-cost airline boom, world travel has become big business. But here's the problem. Airlines want light luggage to save their fuel bill, and you want it strong to protect your souvenirs. So what's the answer? Well, one solution is the aluminium suitcase. At this dedicated factory in Germany, they've been making lightweight aluminium cases for 50 years. The metal is strong, yet light making it perfect for a suitcase. The metal is mostly aluminium mixed with magnesium. This improves the strength but keeps it tough as well as flexible. The first stage when making a suitcase like this is to give the metal its characteristic corrugation. Each sheet is fed into a roller which bends it into shape. The corrugation serves two useful purposes. The first is to give the case its traditional look. The second reason is far more useful as the grooves strengthen each sheet like corrugated iron on a shed roof. By folding the metal through a combination of flats and curves, it can now resist damage, for example when baggage handlers accidentally drop it. Once it's been corrugated, it must be re-flattened, otherwise the next machine wouldn't be able to work with it. So now we've got a flat corrugated sheet. To make an individual case, this now needs to be shaped. Using an industrial cutter, the sheet is clamped into the machine's grasp, which then stamps out the right pieces. This makes the template for one half of the case. For the two separate lids to close securely, the case must have two bands, one for each lip. This worker clamps the band into place and a heavy-duty press bends it with the perfect angle so it will encircle one side of each half. He'll then rivet the band together to form the closed loop to fit the case. The next worker has quite an easy job. He just has to bang on the loops to make sure they fit together. Without a perfect match, the case wouldn't be watertight or secure. 
As well as the bands, the sides for each case also need to be bent using specialist equipment. Here, the panels for each half of the case are twisted and contorted into the right shape. A worker can now attach the handles, latches and screw covers. The sharp edges of the aluminium means all the workers must wear safety gloves. With the handles in place, he can now fit one of the bands to the side which will help draw all the panel edges into place. This is then sealed using more rivets. The plastic corners of the suitcase are next and they add strength to the aluminium body. Finally, the wheels are fitted into place. The case may be light, but you wouldn't want to have to carry it. Now, when you're using so many different parts, something is bound to go wrong. However, the factory have a special department that spends all day testing each model out. They also work to repair and restore any luggage that may have taken too much of a beating in the past. Meanwhile, back on the factory floor, this worker is adding some of the more useful elements to the case, including the fasteners that will hold it shut as well as the hinges. It's time to put the two sides of the case together. Using heavy-duty rivets, this machine seals the deal and the case can now be closed. So we've got our hard-wearing exterior, but the inside could still do with a little work. First, a layer of glue is added, followed by a layer of fabric. This will protect your clothes and keep your souvenirs safe. It's also fitted with a high-tech extendable handle. So, with an aluminium suitcase, you can travel knowing that your bag may end up in a different airport from you, but at least it'll be in one piece. Coming up after the break, mowing the lawn would be much harder work without the engineering that goes into making the blade. And find out more about the tasty snack that's worried about its weight. Never too thick or too thin, the perfect tortilla chip. Mowing the lawn is one thing, but having to rake up all the cuttings and scoop them up yourself is quite another. However, hidden inside most lawn mowers, there's a brilliant little bit of engineering which is designed to help. The life of your lawn mower begins here in the factory. Cutting grass isn't actually all that tough, so they're made from metal and plastic. However, grass is often wet and all that water can corrode the metal bits. Once all the bits have been made, their next stop is this machine, where they're degreased and coated in a hard-wearing layer of anti-corrosive paint. But the real secrets of the labour-saving lawnmower actually begins here, with the blade. Cut from a band of steel that contains about 6% carbon, this really is tough and ideally suited to the job. A massive industrial press cuts fresh blades from the steel while discarding all the rest. It's not wasted though, everything gets recycled. The freshly cut blades emerge from the press here, ready for the next step. So you've got a blade shape, but at the moment it's actually quite blunt, so it needs to be sharpened. The razor you shave with has a cutting angle of about 11 degrees. Lawnmower blades only need an angle of 30 degrees to do their job. They won't end up as sharp as razors, but they will be far stronger when facing tough weeds or even stones. Each of the blades is bent to include a 36 degree angle of wing. It actually makes the grass take off, which sounds amazing, but it's true. Each mower has two blades screwed onto a central pivot. This spins at 2800 revolutions per minute and this is where the wing comes in. The angle pressed into it creates a low pressure area beneath it as it spins. This sucks up the cuttings which are spun around until they pass through the only exit route available to the collection tray. 
the job's done. The blade is nearly ready to be attached to a mower, but there's one safety measure that it has to go through first. You know you're supposed to clear your lawn before you mow it, but sometimes you forget. If the blade was to hit something solid, it could shatter, so they're all sent off to be hardened. First, they are heated to over 840 degrees Celsius for almost 10 minutes. They are then removed from the heat and transferred to be rapidly cooled by almost 500 degrees. This quick cooling realigns the metal's molecules, hardening it. It's now far less fragile and more capable of hitting rocks, stones or forgotten garden tools without shattering. To build the final unit, a worker will place a central pivot and two freshly hardened blades into this machine. It tightens the bolt to the right specification automatically. The pivots are then added to the lawnmower, which has been taking shape on the production line in another part of the factory. Quality control is, of course, important, so the finished mowers are run through several tests. To get that blade spinning and saving your back, the engine has to work, so that's switched on and off. And for safety's sake, the blade's ability to slow down is also pretty important. It must stop within three seconds of the operator hitting the kill switch. So this guy has the exciting job of turning it on and off and timing the blade. And finally, gardens are tough places full of sticks and crazy paving and littered with unused rakes, so that mower better be able to handle it. Each new model spends over 100 hours driving on this wooden track to see whether the design will survive some hard wear and tear. Once it's been put through its paces, it's ready to be left in a garden shed until your lawn needs a quick trim. So just remember, sticks and stones may break your bones, but they won't be bothering this lawnmower. Now, you could be forgiven for thinking this popular little snack was invented in Mexico, but you'd be wrong. Tortillas were invented in Los Angeles in the 1940s, but only made their way to the UK quite recently. Unlike ordinary crisps made from potatoes, tortillas' basic ingredient is maize flour. At this factory, enormous 900 kilo bags of it are fed into a mixing machine to be combined with all the other ingredients. These include sugar, salt and starch. They'll spend a couple of hours in this giant mixer being kneaded into a thick dough like this. However, the mixture isn't ready to be turned into the familiar triangular shape just yet. Big lumps of dough won't make crispy thin tortilla chips. So first, the dough needs to be reduced. It's all passed through a series of circular blades like these, which break it into smaller pieces. This will prepare it for the rollers. To ensure an even mixture, the dough is divided up into compartments. This helps to get a uniform quantity passing along at all times. You never get a fat tortilla chip in a bag because the dough was spread out like this. The dough is now rolled out into an enormous flat sheet. The sheet passes underneath a cylindrical cutter and this is where that famous triangular shape appears. Like a cookie cutter, the hard edges of the roller slice through the dough leaving the perfect triangular piece. The tortilla chip is beginning to take form. Even though this process looks really well organized, there's always a little dough left over. But it's not wasted, it's sent straight back through the dough vats to start all over again. Once the chips have been pressed out, they're separated from each other and sent on to the ovens. But there's one small step first. Remember we couldn't have chips that were too fat? Well, this guy makes sure the chips aren't too thin. 
Too fat and they wouldn't cook properly, too thin and they'll crumble to dust in the back. It's a tough job, but it has to be done to get that perfect tortilla crunch. So we've got the chips into the oven, but they don't spend very long in here. This trip under the grills crisps them up and gives them their traditional color. It also means they don't need to spend so long in the fryer. Emerging from the oven, the chips are allowed five minutes to cool down. This little break also gives the inspectors time to check that none have been burnt. Burnt tortillas really don't go well with a good salsa. Now it's time for the chips to be fried. They'll spend just one minute in a bath of boiling oil at 175 degrees Celsius. Just enough to cook them and for the heat to curl the crisps ever so slightly. Now, if your mouth is now watering and you'd love to grab a handful, think again. At this point, they may look like tortillas, but they have no flavor at all. With popular flavors such as salt and vinegar, cheese and onion, and ready salt are dominating the crisp market, tortilla chip manufacturers have experimented with a variety of alternatives. One was called Clamato, a unique combination of clam and tomato. Getting the flavor onto the chips isn't just a case of chucking it in and shaking the bag. To get a good coating onto each chip, first they're covered in oil again. As this demonstration shows, without oil, all the flavor will just slide off. Enormous sacks of the mixture are added to the top of the machine. Everything from spicy chili to salt and vinegar, and even the famous, if slightly unusual, Clamato. The powder filters down through the pipes and into the machine where the oil-covered chips are being continuously rotated. Here, a device will scatter the flavoring throughout the drum, liberally coating the chips as they spin around. Britons eat around 38,000 tons of tortillas a year, enough to fill up an amazing 193,172 bathtubs. That's a lot of chips. However, before you can rip the bag open and offer them around at your dinner party, first, they've got to be put into the bag. This machine weighs up the chips, then following a precise timing system, each portion is released just at the right moment to fall into a waiting bag. So, as you dunk a handful of tortillas into a tasty salsa, spare a thought for the guy who made sure your chips had the perfect measurements just for you.